Hi, it's Dr. Centeno, and uh, thanks so much for joining us today here at You've Got the Power. Uh, today, we're going to talk about a very important topic. I've discussed it once or twice before, but it's such a critical issue and such an important one for really any diagnosis, not only craniocervical instability, that I think we need to uh, revisit it again. And that is the connection between uh, what's found on imaging and symptoms, meaning that um, whether you've got CCI or other problems in your neck, you know, if we see something on an MRI or other imaging study, we've got to make sure that what we're seeing is actually causing your symptoms. Because if it's not, then treatment for that thing that we see isn't going to be all that valuable. So uh, today we're going to dive into that uh, in a little bit more depth, hopefully, than I've gone into before. And as usual, we'll go through that topic. You can then ask questions about that topic or any other topic. Uh, so let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, looks like that worked and we will get started. Okay, so we're gonna be talking today about the connection between uh, imaging and symptomatic CCI because this is a critical problem that we often see, uh, meaning that patient comes in with CCI on their MRI, we can get, make that part of the diagnosis, but then we go through the other components and it doesn't look likely that what we're seeing on the imaging is causing their symptoms. Uh, so it's a really critical concept for patients to understand. So as you can see here, and I've, I've, I've certainly shared these a lot, this is about a hundred CCI patients who gave us their symptoms. And as you can see, there's some common symptoms here in the larger writing. Headache, dizziness, and lightheadedness uh, are the biggies. Uh, and then there's a bunch of other ones. Obviously, neck pain is definitely in there. Uh, but if we're focusing on the ones that are what doctors call pathognomonic for CCI, meaning you know, specific to CCI, it's going to be these three. And in particular, if somebody has headache and lightheadedness, dizziness, and all the other stuff has been ruled out, the bad stuff that can cause that, then it's probably the upper cervical spine. Now, whether it's CCI or not, that's a separate issue, but it's probably originating from the upper cervical spine. Uh, having neck pain would increase the likelihood of that. Then we get other things like numbness and tingling that I'll put a small check mark behind because lots of other things in the neck can cause numbness and tingling. Same thing with fatigue. I'll put a short check mark there simply because lots of other things cause fatigue. So you get the idea. We're looking for certain kinds of symptoms uh, to get diagnosed with classic CCI. Now, this is a hard one for patients to understand. And that is, we've had research study after research study after research study published that shows that if we look at imaging, there isn't always a connection between what's on the image and symptoms. So for instance, there's a lot of people walking around out there with awful looking MRIs. They don't have any neck pain. There are people walking around out there with MRIs that don't look that bad, and they're in severe disabling neck pain. So while there's a relationship there, it's not a sure thing relationship. And we've got to be careful not to misdiagnose people just because we see things on the imaging. So, uh, and this is this issue of what we call a false positive, right? The, it shows on the imaging, but it's not causing symptoms. 
And again, it's critical to understand that there are probably people walking around out there right now who have CCI on some image who have no symptoms at all. Um, so we've got to be careful to make sure that the CCI we're seeing on imaging is actually causing symptoms. And the reason is that we're going to miss the dartboard, right? We're going to miss the bullseye. If the CCI is not causing your symptoms and we do something to fix the CCI, your symptoms aren't going to change. Um, and you didn't go to the doctor because you had something on your imaging, you had symptoms, and then you got imaging. And so your real goal is to get rid of the symptoms. So how do we increase diagnostic certainty? How do we make sure that we're hitting that bullseye when it comes to craniocervical instability? Well, this is the way I do it. Uh, and so I look at five different things that there has to be a cause for the CCI that makes sense, that the symptoms generally have to match. Oh, hold on a second here. That uh, there's imaging evidence of CCI, that the patient responds in predictable ways to treatment, and that the physical exam matches up as well. So let's go through each one of those. So the first one is what caused the CCI? And the answer is either trauma, uh, HEDS, uh, hypermobile ehlers danlos or adjacent segment disease. We have seen that where the lower cervical spine is fused and it's putting uh, too much force upstairs. I'd also probably add in here that we've seen some scoliosis patients who usually also have uh, some hypermobility, but that's putting asymmetrical forces in the upper cervical spine. Now, uh, we don't have any information that COVID-19 causes CCI. We don't have much credible, credible information that Lyme disease causes CCI. I've gone over those before. And listen, I'm always open to someone doing a well-done research study proving that association. But until we get there, those two are going to not earn a check mark on this one. Then we get into symptoms. And as I said before, if you're looking at pathognomonic symptoms, it's that headache, dizziness, lightheadedness, brain fog that has is highly specific for CCI. Now, there are other things that can cause those. So those need to be ruled out. But... We also see patients who have other symptoms, and while they still may have CCI causing that, we consider this atypical, uh, and that is there isn't headache, dizziness, there's other GI, fatigue, brain fog, tachycardia, visual disturbances, et cetera. So again, maybe a half check mark on uh, the symptoms column if it's atypical. And then for imaging, does a DMX, cervical MRI, CT scan, or upright flexion extension MRI meet the criteria for any of the eight different types of CCI? That one just makes common sense, right? And then response to treatment. Does the patient respond to treatment uh, in predictable ways? Um, it should be in predictable ways. So that means that they get worsened by active physical therapy improved by a cervical collar, improved by upper cervical manipulation, improved by treating the ligaments, improved by treating the upper cervical spine, that kind of stuff. Exam, does the physical exam localize to the upper cervical spine? Now this one I can't do obviously over Zoom, but I can do on a hands-on exam. So let's give you some examples of getting to different degrees of diagnostic certainty. So obviously, this is what we're really looking for, right? Five out of five, the cause makes sense, the symptoms are classic, the imaging shows it, they respond to, tr patient responds to treatment like the average CCI patient does, and the physical exam localized to the upper cervical spine. So there would be a high degree of certainty, in this case, that CCI is causing symptoms. 
Now, here we've taken one of these out, right? We've got atypical symptoms, but we've got a good cause, uh, we, meaning we know that there's a, a cause out there that makes sense for that patient. We've got imaging that shows it. They respond to treatment in predictable ways. And the physical exam is strongly associated with the upper cervical spine. So here we've got good certainty that CCI is causing the symptoms. Here it's getting a little tougher, right? We've taken out cause. Uh, so the cause is a question mark. The exam doesn't really line up, but the symptoms are classic. The imaging shows it and they respond to treatment in predictable ways. So we've got a moderate certainty that CCI is causing symptoms, but there's definitely gonna be a false uh, positive rate here. Maybe one in three of those patients is not going to have CCI causing their symptoms. And then finally, poor certainty that CCI is causing symptoms. All we really have here is imaging and response to treatment. The rest of it is negative. So it's unlikely that this person is going to respond to treating their CCI. So in summary, it's important for me to treat patients who have the maximum likelihood of success. And that means that we know that CCI is causing their symptoms. Diagnostic certainty is therefore important. And if you have anything less than high diagnostic certainty, we'll, we'll have that conversation because I, I think that's a critical thing to discuss with patients. So let's take some questions here. Let me get out of this. Okay, see what we got here. I got a bunch of questions. Uh, Duck P, I got PRP two weeks ago, but just now got cold flu or bacterial infection, strep throat will affect the outcome of the PRP treatment. Probably not. In your experience seeing men with HEDS, have you noticed that women HEDS patients seem to suffer from other comorbidities at a higher rate compared to HEDS men? Um, yeah, I think that's accurate. I think that would be a statement that's consistent with my experience. Bethany, I actually said I'm coming to see you on Wednesday for my second PIC. I wondered if you can do a nerve block for cervicogenic headache at the same time. Um, not at the same time, just because the uh, anesthetic concentrations that we would use for a nerve block um, could impact the health of the uh, stem cells in the bone marrow concentrate. So that's something uh, that we'd have to do separated by time if we were going to do something like that from a diagnostic standpoint. Bethany, I've done this in my palate, tongue, and throat. Could it be called the irritation of the AL CAO plexus? Uh, yeah, so Bethany, there'd be two possible uh, links there. One would be, as you brought up, the, the plexus that's in the front of the upper cervical spine here. The other could be hypoglossal uh, or cranial nerve 9 or 12 or both irritation. A lot of doctors I met said they can see the bones under ultrasounds during injection. Uh, you can see bone with ultrasound. You just can't see through bone is the problem. Um, so you can see bones, but then the bones reflect the sound waves back. So you can't see what's behind the bone. And that's the problem with using ultrasound for spinal injections. You can do it for simple spinal injections. Um, and in some cases, it works out quite well, like injecting the supraspinous, interspinous ligaments in the neck. But for example, injecting the upper cervical C1, C2 facet joint, I'd never do it, uh, simply because you can do it, but you can't do it well, meaning that I can't see where the contrast is going. And I don't know, for instance, if it's ending up in your vertebral artery under ultrasound, whereas with fluoroscopy, plus digital subtraction angiography, I can easily see that. So it's it's below the standard of care, in my opinion, based on that. Regenix, been advanced by Amy Norman. Do you recommend getting tethered cord assessed, treated prior to PSL if it is suspected, what complications may occur if it's untreated to see with PSL? None. Uh, yeah, this is a myth. Um, and it's a myth I want to strongly stomp out here. Um, again, 
the concept is uh, a cult tethered cord, not tethered cord. Tethered cord is a different animal. Tethered cord means that you've got a tumor or something else that's pulling down the uh, spinal cord through the phylum terminale or nerve roots. A cult, so that's a real thing. A cult tethered cord is quite different. A cult tethered cord is the concept that uh, the cord is being stretched too much. Now, listen, if you uh, need a detethering surgery because there's extra stretch from a, a type uh, 2A, I'm sorry, a type 1A CCI, meaning a low clivoaxial angle CCI, that's only one of the eight different types of CCI, then uh, if you get in a detethering, it's a permanent procedure. There's no way to go back. Um, and it's a much more invasive procedure than PICL. So to get it before the PICL would be backwards uh, because what you're going to do then there is you've got a procedure that's not irreversible, meaning we're not uh, dramatically altering the normal biomechanics by doing the PICL, but you are dramatically altering the biomechanics by cutting the phylum terminale in a te occult tethered cord release surgery. So if you have that specific type of low clivoaxial angle uh, CCI, which is a small percentage of the patients I treat, maybe 15 to 20%, then you might consider getting an occult tethered cord surgery if you need it after PICL. But to do it before PICL would be a dumb idea because you're putting the cart before the horse. You're doing a more invasive procedure that's irreversible and then doing a less invasive procedure. Remember, to keep patients safe, we always go with less invasive procedures first. And then if that doesn't work, we go to the next most invasive procedure that's likely to help. We don't do it backwards because that exposes patients to unnecessary risk. And again, I want to make sure that everyone understands with an occult tethered cord surgery, that's a permanent procedure that can't be undone. We are permanently altering and disturbing the function of your central nervous system or the biomechanical function. Now, listen, there may be some patients that need that because of stretch pressure uh, due to a low CXA on the brain stem and upper cervical cord, but you wouldn't want to do it backwards, meaning you wouldn't want to do that and then a PICL procedure because that would be the more invasive procedure before the less invasive procedure. We always go less invasive procedure. That doesn't work. More invasive procedure. Uh, Duck P, I know that in some cases ligament laxity can cause muscles around the ligament to get tight. Can a feeling of looseness in a ligament cause the local muscles to shut off instead of getting tight? Um, usually it's getting tight, but shut off is, it's not quite so simple. So realize that uh, the proper function of those muscles up there, the stabilizing muscles, would be to turn off and on, turn off and on, turn off and on. Um, if they're constantly on, then they're not functioning correctly. And that can actually paradoxically lead to atrophy uh, because the muscles are working way too hard. Uh, so shutting off is a sort of a misnomer. Now, muscles can get shut off as well meaning that if there's not instability and there's just pain coming from a, let's say an upper cervical facet joint, your body can shut those muscles down because having them active may increase the pain. So it's a little bit more complex. Bethany, do all the ligaments injected for PICL procedure get the same amount of stem cells or can you overfill a ligament that seems more damaged than others? Uh, each ligament that we're targeting and that's specific to the eight different types of CCI, uh, would get the amount of volume it takes to fill the ligament. Now, that would mean that smaller ligaments get smaller amounts, larger ligaments get larger amounts. 
I don't know that there's any advantage to us over filling a ligament because the concern there is always putting too much volume in there plus swelling, which will occur after the injection and that itself causing more problems than need to be caused. Arno, every MRI or CTA I have, um, I see one is rotated neutral position to the left, my dance distance to the sides of C1 is asymmetric left and right. Are these signs of CCI? Uh, they could be. Um, remember, CCI is an, a, an active thing, right? So while you can show, see signs of it on a static image, like we're talking about here, you really need a movement-based image to show it because it's a movement-based concept. But certainly what you're saying ups the, the likelihood that a, that a movement-based study will show uh, instability. Uh, it's been advanced by Clay Perkins. If you have relatively mild cases of CCI, would getting treatment now prevent it from advancing to a severe case? Does it make more sense to risk it getting much worse by putting off treatment? Yeah, I don't know what a mild case of CCI is, meaning... Uh, if we're talking about uh, different kinds of upper cervical treatment, you really would only want to get it treated if it was causing substantial disabling uh, symptoms. Now, would you want to let substantial disabling symptoms go on for a long period of time? No, because then you risk those neurologic changes or the changes to the joints getting baked in and it becoming harder to treat. Having said that, alternatively, if you have um, just mild manageable symptoms, then we've got to look at risk benefit analysis on whether or not um, a specific type of procedure linked to a specific type of CCI, one of those eight makes sense. Lissy, can you please one more time if someone should choose left and right? I don't know what that means. Arno, if I remember correctly, or another live, you said you're going to be unavailable due to a sailing trip. I wonder this being how long. Uh, will you still be able to do tel telemedicine calls? Yeah, Arno, I'll be out from April 22nd to June 1st. Uh, and I, I will still be doing uh, telemedicine during that time. Uh, so what I won't be doing is seeing patients in the clinic, but I'll still be uh, doing telemedicine. Uh, so nothing will change if we're talking about a telemedicine. Uh, so the only thing that will change is I won't be seeing patients in clinic uh, during that time, but I'll still be doing telemedicines and doing quite a few each week. Sabina, do you think arthritic change in the jaw joint like flattening complaint to CCI and the positioning of the neck or even the whole body? Have you ever seen this problem before? Thank you. Yeah, Sabina, there's a big link between, I think we've even got some videos on uh, the link between CCI and TMJ. Basically, what we tend to see is that the jaw muscles start to take on a stabilization role for the head on the neck, and, and that causes uh, problems, and that can cause overload in the jaw. So that's really what's what's happening there. Um, so there's a big link between those two that we see. Um, sorry about the phone. I'm a doctor. I got to keep it on. I don't get to turn it off. Uh, it never gets turned off for that reason. Uh, Ulysses, uh, don't muscle atrophy or muscle spasms cause CCI or after CCI, it starts to happen. Uh, more um, after CCI starts to happen. Darian, if significant scar tissue was formed for a ligament, can PRP still help heal, heal the tears? Will it get rid of the scar tissue? Um, you know, Darian, I'd need to, Darian, I'd need to know more about what kind of scar tissue we're talking about. Uh, all scar tissue generally is is disorganized collagen. So the so the goal with PRP or bone marrow concentrate or prolotherapy is to give the ligament another bite at that healing apple to different degrees, PRP the least, bone marrow concentrate the most, PRP is kind of in the middle. Uh, so pro, sorry, prolotherapy the least, PRP in the middle, bone marrow concentrate uh, the most, and to reorganize that collagen. Now, is it possible that there's such severe scarring in you know, rare cases that that might not happen? That's possible. 
but you know, we'd have to see what you're talking about there. That's the kind of scarring we would see on MRI. Uh, it's been advanced by Norma Beal. Can patients who have had a cervical disc replacement benefit from this procedure? Uh, if we're talking about PICL, yes, but realize that uh, based on the most recent data, uh, a cervical disc replacement acts as a fusion. So there's still adjacent segment disease happening, meaning more forces being placed above that fusion. Uh, so if we're talking about an artificial disc replacement below, it may impact the results from uh, this kind of procedure. Sure, uh, thank you. Tom, can CCI cause phrenic nerve inflammation damage? Could that account for my atypical presentation, insomnia, sleep disturbance, fatigue, short of breath at rest, exercise intolerance, heart palpitations? Um, I don't know about phrenic nerve issues. We generally don't see that. That would be very, very atypical. Some of those things can certainly be um, a uh, related to vagus nerve issues. Uh, and that's more common. As far as the shortness of breath, I mean, all of that obviously needs to get worked up. You would need to get a sleep study. You would need to see a cardiologist to make sure that there is no arrhythmias and other things. And assuming everything else is ruled out and there is CCI and all of those other check marks are, are good, then uh, that's when we would consider those two things probably connected. Robert, Dr. Katz's study appeared to have patients at left eight. Yeah, so again, not a uh, not something that we're, we can get to a diagnosis at all because if we take a bunch of scoliosis patients, we'll see the same thing, and none of them have C CCI. So we need to be a little careful there. Thanks, Arno. Happy to help. John, do you? Do you or were you ever treat cervical osteophytes with barbitage procedure? No, it's a little too dangerous in the cervical spine with something like a barbitage simply because it, well, number one is if you don't fix the instability, they're just going to come back. And number two is that if you get a bone fragment that you can't then remove, that bone fragment can really damage one of the spinal nerves. Uh, Ulissi, are you the only clinic who use PPP only? Uh, I don't even know what you're referring to there. So we would uh, tend to use lots of different types of orthobiologics, um, platelet-rich plasma, platelet-poor plasma sometimes in, in specific indications, uh, platelet lysate, um, uh, plasma-rich in A2M, uh, bone marrow concentrate down in Grand Cayman, culture expanded mesenchymal stem cells. Um, so I'm not quite sure what that question means. Uh, it's been advanced by Sherry Scop. I started taking your stem cell support formula and that seems to have helped my neck pain. Is it safe to continue that while I get my DMX and hopes to get in the PICL procedure? Sure. Yeah, that, that's fine. It's got some good anti-inflammatory components in there. So I'm glad to hear that it's, that it's helping in general. Adina, what do you consider positive for CCI in the physical exam? Yes, yeah, so the physical exam first has to localize palpation-wise to the upper cervical spine. So that, so I go through and I palpate every single cervical facet joint, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, all the way down. And we would like to see that localized in the upper neck joints. Um, involvement sternocleidomastoids, involvement of specific nerves, greater occipital nerve, lesser occipital nerve, third occipital nerve, transverse cervical nerve, superficial cervical plexus, certain uh, specific types of eye tracking abnormalities, et cetera, et cetera. Isabella, prolotherapy has damaged the occipital nerves. Can PRP injection heal those nerves? Yeah, Isabella, a lot really depends on how much damage and what kind of damage. So one of the reasons why we, we try not to inject prolotherapy in directly into a nerve is that it, the usual prolotherapy solutions would cause damage to that nerve. Um, 
So if it's mild damage, then yes, PRP or a platelet lysate uh, injected around the nerve may help. But a lot depends on how much damage. Um, so that's, a, that's an open-ended answer, I know. Uh, Duck P, uh, if you have someone, if you see someone has mild ALR ligament laxity, but also they seem to have mild muscle atrophy, which do you think is like the cause of heavy head feeling? Well, listen, I would certainly have them try strengthening those muscles first um, and see if that moves the needle and if they can tolerate that. Uh, obviously, if that doesn't, then we may need to treat the mild ligament laxity. But if they've just got mild symptoms that they can control and they can tolerate strengthening, that's strengthening first all the way. Duck, if someone has subaccipital muscle atrophy, do you think it's likely they also have weakness in the deep neck flexors as well? Probably, although those are much, much harder for us to quantify on imaging. Duck, I've been doing the CCI exercises. I noticed that head extensions rotations seem to irritate my C0, C1 joint, but the clock circles do not irritate the C0, C1 joint. Can I just do this movement? Sure, yeah, and, and that may mean that you need to get that zero one one joint treated um, in order to be able to take full advantage of that muscle strengthening. Because realize when, when a body part hurts like that, the body shuts those uh, muscles down and, you know, all the strengthening in the world is not going to make a huge difference if every time the muscle gets activated, the body shuts it down because that part hurts. Doc, curious if you read the case series of low back pain, secondary to severe sorry, joint laxity, successfully treated middle urgent using leukocyte rich 3 to 4 XPRP. Um, I have, yes. And again, uh, in... In most patients, um, and I'm sure it wasn't older aged patients, because you got to realize in 70, by the time you hit mid 60s and up, uh, most patients have fused SI joints. So SI joint instability tends to be a problem of the young. Uh, but uh, again, and a case series is not going to be a real high uh high evidence thing. But if you use three to four XPRP leukocyte rich, could it work? Sure. If you had a couple 20 year olds in there, a couple 30 year olds, a couple 40 year olds, maybe one or two 50 year olds, um, you'll have a percentage that respond. Now, could you have upped the percentage of responders by just improving the uh, concentration? Absolutely. You can uh, dramatically up that. So uh, it's like anything else. Everything is uh, in medicine is increasing response, decreasing response, and then there's likelihood of response. Amity uh, does cyanic symptoms, including burning, increase after lumbar epidural. Not usually. Um, no, um, it can. But one of the things that's really critical to understand uh, is the, the skill um, of doing these procedures varies very widely, even amongst folks that are fellowship trained to do them. So for instance, um, you know, it's not easy sometimes in particular patients uh, to avoid um, sticking the nerve root with a small needle while you're doing an epidural. Now, if you've got high skill, that rarely happens. But if you are doing it very quickly and you don't have high skill, meaning you haven't done 10,000 of these, maybe you've only done a couple hundred, um, the nerve is going to get more traumatized during the epidural. So usually, if you're getting burning-like symptoms afterwards, it that could be one cause. Isabella, when I bend down and my neck goes into flexion, my muscles spasm. What can be the cause of this? Could it be an indication for ALR transverse instability or just muscle weakness? You know, Isabella, it could be either. Um, certainly would be a good idea if you've got symptoms that match to get CCI ruled out. Good day, Dr. Tino. I'm doing an upright MRI soon, flexion extension. It's a phone R0.6 T. Are there any specific settings I must instruct them with? 
I mean, the biggest ones are flexion and extension. Um, so it's more getting full flexion and full extension and staying as still as you can in each position because movement will degrade uh, the images. Uh, so the average phonar upright flexion extension that I see uh, would be fine. So there's no reason to do specific protocols, meaning there isn't enough punch in the magnet um, to really get a good image of the ligaments themselves, ALR transverse but we can do lots of different measurements and flexion and extension. So I think it's, uh, so there's nothing specific there. Now, if we were talking about uh, a head coil type image of the upper cervical ligaments, then there would be a specific protocol. Amity, how soon can you be able to do physical therapy after PRP spinal injections as tens and ultrasound treatments okay? Um, it uh, depends on the type of PRP injections we're doing, but in general, it would be an activity as tolerated. So that means if your pain has come down to its normal level, then you can go back to physical therapy. Uh, TENS and ultrasound would be just fine. Now, if your pain remains high from the procedure itself, then that's when you should cut back. Isabella, specifically in the upper zero one area, what and when there is more weight on it by bending forward. So not so much when I'm upright. Oh, so your pain, I think, when you flex is in zero one area. Yeah, so that's something to look at, possibly that type one C CCI, where you've got a shallow um, zero one joint, and that's allowing translation of the skull forward. So just hearing that, I would want to rule out uh, that type of craniocervical instability, specifically a member that's just one of the eight different types. Each one of those different types links to specific ligaments that have to be treated. Uh, Arno, if CCI is mood-based illness, how can, uh, can it be that people still feel ill and well when they're just sitting down and not moving their head left or right, just sitting at a desk? Yeah, because Arno realized that having instability means that things get out of place. Uh, when things get out of place, that doesn't feel good at all. Uh, that puts pressure on all sorts of things that that shouldn't be having pressure on them. Dan, at what level does spinal cord normally end? Is it halfway at L2 too low? Um, usually it's T12 L1-ish um, is where the, the usual spinal cord ends. Um, now, if you look it up, you'll probably see that the terminus can be anywhere from probably T12 to L2. Um, and if it's any lower than that is when we start to get concerned. Now, if it's ending at L2, then that's something that probably should be looked at just uh, to see if there's any obvious issues that might be pulling it down because ending at L2 is a bit low. But again, you got to take a look at those images carefully because it's not always so easy to see the conus medullaris. And that's what you're looking at, the end or the tip of the spinal cord and, and where that lives. Um, and again, not always easy to see because there's a bunch of nerve roots that come out of it. Uh, the cauda equina, which is Latin for the horse's tail. And it looks like a horse's tail of nurse of nerve roots. So um, just Make sure you're looking at where the conus terminates and not where some of those nerves come out. Era, my skull tilted backwards. I thought I had type 0, 1 instability and 2, 3. I started having more sideways instability now and some of the things and it's causing my neck and head to get stuck. It's hindering the full range. Will this be a problem in MRI results? You should show full movable range of laxness. laxness. I mean, just get as much range of motion as you can. Uh, an option is to get a Valium prescription, let's say from your family doctor or your treating doctor um, or a Xanax prescription, uh, which will relax those muscles and make you a little sleepy. Obviously, you need a driver to and from in that situation, but that can oftentimes help with range of motion or even take a Percocet or a Vicodin, hydrocodone, oxycodone. Uh, tablet before you go to try to maximize the range of motion. Amity, can cervical PRP epidural 
necessarily if there's no neurologic symptoms, but only mild herniation and cervical. Not quite sure what you mean with that one. Dana, what do you consider a low CXA? I've had leg weakness collapsing since PRP. It's gotten better and it gets better with atlas adjustment. Worse if my skull slides back as I'm walking up a slight incline. Yeah, low CXA, Diana, would be, well, so the, the problematic range is 120. So getting close to 120 is an issue. So if you look at the Henderson et al. paper, uh, 120 was where the maximum concerning stretch was. So if you are in that sub 130, and more importantly, if it goes, let's say, from 135 to 125, neutral to flexion, then that's a concern because we're getting close to that 120 of putting too much stretch on the brainstem and spinal cord. So those are the numbers that I would look at based on uh, that data published by Henderson. Uh, and that's in the CXA uh, Facebook Live, I think I did. Kimmy, upright MRI, NDMX show 3.71 ADI, flexion extension, 2.3 neutral, grab hooks at 9.4. I'm assuming that's on the upright MRI, overhang 3.7 left, 6.5 right, C2 spine, uh, it's possible significant damage to be a little, yeah, so. Uh, so I, I can't diagnose over the internet, Kimmy. Uh, I can tell you that, um, uh, looking at, so the types of things that we would be looking at would be if you have a high grab oaks, a high grab oaks, uh, over nine would be a type two, a instability, uh, overhang above four millimeters would be a type 2B. Uh, and the rest of it doesn't really play into making uh, a CCI diagnosis uh, at this point. Era, well, an upright MRI shows subluxations. Uh, not the kind of chiropractic subluxations, uh, if that's the context or of the term. But if we're talking about um, bones literally out of position, when they get out of position with movement, yes. Uh, Dana, I'm able to hold my head up much longer since my posterior PRP. Yeah, I still have severe bottle head and skull sliding. So PICL is my future. Thank you for your expertise. Sure, Dana. Happy to help. Amity, is it okay to use lidocaine patch after spinal PRP injections and how it really can it be used? Um, that's a good question. Uh, lidocaine is toxic to local tissues and, and cells. Um, now, it's unlikely that a lidocaine patch on the skin is going to get into the peripheral circulation at a toxic dose. So the answer is, based on that quick analysis, yes, you can, you can do it. Fatchin, for how long does PRP inject in the upper neck set joints can it provide a benefit if instability is not fixed and the joint can become painful again? Yeah, a lot would depend on the amount of instability and the status of the joint when we started. But if the status of the joint is good and the instability is mild to moderate, it might last a couple of months. Uh, Doug P, do you think a fellowship trained sport medicine physicians have ultrasound guided skills at the level of physical medicine rehab doctor? Yeah, just realize that it's not so much that distinction as it is um, someone who has done an interventional spine fellowship or is old enough to you know, be too old, meaning there weren't fellowships available, but they've done additional spine training and have done thousands of fluoro guided spine procedures is always going to be dramatically better at doing spine injections than a sports medicine doc who went to a weekend course on how to inject a few things in the spine and just light years apart in those skill sets. Uh, so if that's the comparison we're making, there's no comparison between those, those two. Isabella, after 01 PRP, I had my jaws done for TMJ. I don't know what jaws done means. Seems like my pulse cell tennis got a lot worse, also more neck pain. How could this be? Can you make the neck instability symptoms worse temporarily? Um, 
so I don't, so Isabella, you'd need to tell me more about who did the procedure, what was being injected. Um, I think when you say your jaw's done, that meant that they injected your TMJ. So give me some more information so I have some idea there of what was done, because that doesn't tell me a lot about what was actually done. John, could you please link the fasting mimicking diet you recommend? Yeah, that is Prolon. Uh, and I think it's I'm doing this off the top of my head. I think that's the right link. Um, so I just put that there in the comments. Uh, Adina, if there's a small distance between stylo and C1 resulting in obstruction of jugular vein, is ligament strengthening a possible solution? Yeah, Adina, you know, the, it's not the, first it's not the styloid. It, it's, the, it's the ligament that gets calcified. And the issue in the patient population we're talking about is that instability causes C1 to push the internal jugular vein up against that calcified ligament. Now, it's possible that in some patients, you need to cut the calcified ligament. The problem is once you do that, you destabilize the spine. So if you have an unstable upper cervical spine to begin with, then cutting the styloid is doing it backwards. You would want to stabilize the cervical spine first, then cut this, the stylohyoid ligament. It's really what we're talking about. Because if you do it the other way, once you cut that ligament, you're making the cervical spine permanently more unstable. And that's a problem, right? If you already have CCI, that's like throwing gasoline on a bonfire. Amity, how safe is endoscopic lumbar decompression for spinal stenosis? Can PRP injections resolve the spinal stenosis? Um, I would say that about 80% uh, of the stenotic patients we treat do well with just, well, with PRP in lots of different areas to treat the whole functional spinal unit because it's usually a problem of stenosis plus degenerative instability. Get rid of the degenerative instability, treat the nerve, symptoms go away. Uh, about 20% would still need uh, to have that area open. Um, how safe is endoscopic decompression? Depends on the, the user, um, like many things, right? You're working right around the nerve, so you've got to have an extremely experienced person not to damage the nerve. Ulysses, does CCI cause limited range of motion too? It can certainly lead to that, yeah. Happy to help. Duck, roughly speaking, what percentage of your CCI patients don't complain about their head feeling heavy? Uh, I would say about half complain that it feels heavy, so about half. Um, Jennifer, I take six milligrams of Xanaflex at bedtime only. I was concerned to take some form of DMX, but I'm worried I, I will want to sleep all day if I take the full six milligrams. At 10 a.m. DMX, do you think two milligrams would be sufficient? Could be um, if you are made sleepy. Um, I would take the dose, uh, maybe do four milligrams. But again, I'm, I'm, I can't give you medical advice over the internet. So uh, that's something I would talk to the doctor who prescribed the Xanaflex about. Duck P, Fort Myers, Florida is number one snake oil prolotherapist who thinks he can treat CCI. Gotcha. Manuela, uh, what can we do to manage pain in between PICLs? Can I try other type of injections locally, like epidural steroid injections? No. Um, listen, most people I've tried or who have tried this have failed and it's blown up the other direction, meaning they've gotten worse, not better. Um, and that's just doing net positive injections like PRP and platelet lysate. So I don't recommend that at all. Um, and an epidural steroid injection would harm the cells that we put in. So that'd be the last thing you would want to do. Uh, high dose corticosteroids, like the kind that are used in epidural steroid injections, will um, harm the whole healing response. So not a good idea. 
You're listening. Never let a sport medicine doctor do CCI treatment. They make things worse. Uh, hey, Chris, love greetings from Berlin. Oh, hey, Christian. Hey, Christian uh, had done a uh, interview with me for the German uh, CCI group. So thank you very much, Christian, for doing that. Maybe you can uh, throw the link to that in the comments. Um, that would be great. It was the interview was done in English and Kristen asked a lot of very interesting questions. So uh, go right ahead and throw the link down there so people can can watch that video. Duck P, I meant to say it's important person is doing perfect joint injections using ultrasound, not CCI spine injections. Um, yeah, so uh, when it comes to uh, Duck P, not quite sure what I'm answering there, but I'll just give that a thumbs up. Uh, John, the link seems good. Thank you. Great. Isabel, I'm not 100% sure. I said I had jaw issues and clicking jaw on the left side of the lot of muscle times for the jaw. Two CCs. Yeah, Isabel, I need to know imaging guidance, not imaging guidance, level of skill of the provider. What were they trying to inject? What did they documented they injected? All that kind of stuff. Um, but it brings up a good point again, and we've talked about this, the difference between simple ligament injections and stick the needle in, in there. I'm not, I'm not quite sure where it is versus targeting specific structures. So that, that gets to be a problem when, you know, you can both are called PRP, but they're quite different in how they're done. And uh, also whether or not they're going to work, depending on what, depending on which one of the eight types of CCI you have. Uh, Amber, tinnitus specific to CCI. Have you had success limiting tinnitus? In general, yes. We've seen tinnitus go down in most patients as we've treated their CCI. Bethany, I know you said a study from disc replacement over a disc bulge of five six is already causing that level to very stiff without much movement. Disc replacement still help it a lot since decompressing the cord and nerves, allowing for more movement. You would think that's the selling point, but so far that selling point has not been documented in the peer reviewed literature. Uh, the research trends in the direction of it acting like a fusion. Now, why? Uh, it could be one of two reasons. There's a significant number of those discs that never move as advertised. Um, I see them all the time. So it could be that. Um, there's also the possibility that the abnormal motion that's happening is causing uh, worse issues above and below. So hard to say. Kimmy, how is the PLL strengthened? Uh, the posterior longitudinal ligament that would have to be uh, through an intradiscal approach um, and is a big deal with higher levels of risk involved. So if the PLL doesn't need to be targeted, uh, that's usually safer. Um, and again, it usually doesn't need to be targeted. Now, again, realize if you're reading a DMX report, um, there's many of those DMX reports are done, you know, by doctors who are very med legally focused. So they're reading out every tiny little thing they can see. The big question is what of that is causing your symptoms, which is only where I would go. Amity, chia seed oil, black seed oil, and turmeric supplements okay to consume after PRP injections. I don't know about chia seed oil or black seed oil, but turmeric is fine. Isabella, uh, it was with ultrasound, elastical ligaments were targeted, repeat more questions. So they never really did the facet joints, Isabella, if it was with ultrasound. So that's that's something you never got treated. Uh, that requires, uh, in those levels, x-ray with digital subtraction and geography to confirm that you're in the joint. So it sounds like they did a simple prolotherapy approach where they did the ligaments and maybe touched down on the lamina, uh, but those joints weren't injected. Locks is the throbbing sensation of the neck and spine, a common symptom you see in patients with CCI. Throughout the whole neck and spine, usually not. But again, it's the symptom complex we're looking at. Amity, does DMX require to diagnose lumbar instability? No, usually DMX doesn't work well in the lumbar spine. So that would be more flexion extension x-rays. 
John, how often do you hire second of the SEM and CCI patients? How do you determine if this is necessary? Quite a bit. Um, so we now do two types of, or I now do two types of treatments there. I can only speak for myself. Um, and one is uh, focused on the superficial cervical plexus and transverse cervical nerve. That's the posterior aspect of the SCM. The other focused on the vagus nerve, and that's the middle aspect of the SCM. Amber, which treatments for CI have a limited tinnitus? Or maybe I should ask which structures... Uh, yeah, not a specific structure. It's something that is linked more to CCI in general, but we need to know the specific type of CCI to know which specific structures need to be treated. Era, my connection broke down. Not sure if you already answered. I asked about having C0, C1 instability and one to two, possibly two, three now, but since developing cybers instability, my head and neck get stuck, so I'm unable to flex extend that much. Yeah. So that's why I would say, era, you know, have your family doctor or whichever doctor you're working with give you Valium, Xanax, Percocet, something so that you can relax the muscles enough where you can get maximum range of motion. Lissy, do you have a document about the SCM? I think we've uh, uh, done an SCM video. Uh, that might have been three, four months ago, something like that. Yes, I've heard of Dr. Adelson. Uh, Dr. Adelson is not a physician, uh, not a physician specialist. He's a naturopath. Uh, you can read my blogs about Dr. Adelson if you go to Regenix.com. Um, I'll put that address here. So if you go to Regenix.com and you... Uh, Go to the blog, uh, they can, you can then, or just search on Emergenics.com, put his name in there. You'll see my opinions on Dr. Adelson. Do I believe that Dr. Adelson has, in my uh, personal opinion, the skills to treat CCI? No, I do not. Um, uh, he does not have the training necessary to do this kind of work that I'm describing. Ulysses, is C1C2 responsible for turning right or left or doing the yes, no movement? Uh, turning right, left. Okay, guys, so I've got this podcast thing to do at 2 p.m. So I'm going to start wrapping it up here, 2 p.m. my time. Um, so today we talked about this concept of getting to diagnostic certainty and trying to up that as much as possible. And when we don't have high levels of certainty, Trying to make sure we explain that to patients so they understand that what we're seeing on the imaging may not be causing their symptoms. Now, obviously, ideally, we want what we're seeing on the imaging to cause their symptoms. So anyway, long story short, I'm going to take just two more questions, then I got to go. So Era, uh, what about my neck getting stuck for the MRI uh, with the Xenix always help? feel like a due to yeah, so I, I don't know if it's going to help, Era. Uh, best I can do is, is to have you work with your, your uh, doctor that prescribes medications. Uh, and maybe you want to try different things out before you get there. What's the best diagnostic values to diagnose C1, C2 rotatory instability? So that's a type 2B. Uh, it's going to be uh, DMX is usually the best. A rotational CT scan will do in a pinch. Okay, guys, uh, I am going to have to uh, wrap it up. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, I will be here this Monday. Uh, not quite sure of the topic yet. And then again, just to start preparing you, when I am uh, gone from April 22nd to June 1st, I'll still be doing uh, telemedicines, and I'll be releasing one video a week. And I'll be doing sort of an impromptu when I can when I can do it. Uh, just Q&A, um, not a video, then Q&A, probably just a half hour of Q&A on European time, because that's where I'll be. So that's going to be at odd US times, but if you're in Europe, it's going to be in the middle of your day. Um, so I, I would love to say I could tell you I'll be doing it exactly on this day, but I can't based on what it is I'm doing. But so I'll be releasing a video and then uh, doing an impromptu uh, Q&A during sometime that week just that we can kind of keep some of this going. 
Um, and I'll probably come up with a place where you guys can put questions so that if I haven't gotten to a question or if you're asleep when I'm doing this video or if it's super early in the morning or crazy late at night, um, you'll have a chance in the U.S. to leave some questions for me to answer. So thanks so much for watching. I will be here uh, this coming Monday. Thank you.